But our enemy's tactics is this. They're called discouragement, complacency, pride, fear, your own will or own agenda. That's a hard one for all of us right there. But he uses confusion, laziness, and then small little frustrations that you don't really pay attention to. They're like little grains of sand that get... You ever have sand in your shorts at the beach? It's that, that little irritation. But sometimes it starts out with just a little bit of sand in you, and then it builds into something else. That's how the enemy does. He starts out small, and it gets bigger. But what it does is discipline, submission, and obedience must be a part of your training, and you need to be stripped away of your old way of thinking, your old self, you know, you have to do this daily. You get no days off in boot camp, and you don't get any days off hardly from the enemy, too, in this world. Can, can I get an amen on that one? Come on. Uh, we're going to talk more later about the battlefield of the mind. How many of us struggle in our mind? You don't have to raise your hand, but we all do. We all have thought patterns or old ways of thinking, and we're going to talk about the battlefield of the mind. But here we see, as we read, read 2 Timothy, we see young Timothy. He's about a teen or maybe an early 20s. And he's being enlisted and signed up for duty. Look at 2 Timothy 2.1. It says this. It says, Timothy, my dear son. This is Paul talking. Be strong through the grace that God gives you in Christ Jesus. You have heard me teach things that have been confirmed by many reliable witnesses. You've watched how I've done it. You've, you've been following me. Now you have to apply it. Now teach these truths to other trustworthy people who will be able to pass them on to others. He's enlisting them to go out and make new soldiers. Endure suffering along with me as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. Soldiers don't get tied up in the affairs of civilian life and then they cannot, because then they cannot please the officer who enlisted them. Paul is, is his commanding officer, and he's now instructing him how to be a soldier for Jesus Christ. He's telling him that there are going to be battles. There are things that you're going to face as you go out into this mission field, and I want you to be prepared for everything that's about to come against you. There are key components to becoming a soldier, not only a physical soldier, but a soldier for Jesus. And the first one is discipline. Ouch. That's the one that hurts all of us, right? Webster defines it as training to prove strength or self-control. We want to be a leader. Sometimes you got to be a follower to be a leader. He went to the disciples one by one and said, follow me. Follow me. I'm going to show you what we're going to do. You're going to be fishers of men. I want you to follow me. But to be a good follower, you have to be a good, we have to be a good follower to be a good leader. Disciples spent three years learning under Jesus. They gave up every, they dropped their nets. They dropped everything that they did to follow him. Their whole livelihood was based around him telling them to follow him. They had to be trained. They had to be selfless. They had to become disciples so they could make disciples. So many times we don't want to go through that process, but yet we want to, we want to make disciples, but yet we won't be discipled ourselves. Oh, this is a little bit hard. I'm sweating up here because I'm speaking to myself a little bit too. But how much are you willing to invest to see God transform your life and the lives of your family? Listen, we want the promotion without the preparation. We want the platform without plowing anything. We want the status before we... So, oh, this is a little bit rough this morning. We want the status, but we don't want to seek after the one in charge. The Bible says this. It says, you've been faithful over a few things, and I'm going to make you ruler over many things. But where it starts at is servants become rulers. Servants who are teachable, who are humble, who are adaptable, they're the ones that God are going to use to make, a war, make an impact in this war that we are fighting right now. The next word is another hard one, submission. James 4, 7 says this. It says, therefore, submit to God. Resist the devil. Say resist. resist. And he will flee from you. That's a promise in the Bible. But submit means you've got to yield or surrender to authority and you have to give in to it. We all have to give of ourselves. But listen to what 2 Timothy says. It says, for men will be lovers of themselves, ugh, lovers of money, boasters, Proud, I'm, I'm throwing this in here because that's the culture that we're living in right now. 
proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Got any parents, got any kids that's acting a fool right now? Unthankful and unholy. It really does look like the culture around us. Most of the goals are for self-gratification and self-achievement. We want it our way, just like Burger King, have it our way. We want it the way we want it. We're going to do the best that we can, and you can't tell me what to do. Not being submissive does this. It hinders our training. We want control. We want to decide our own destiny. We want to put God on the back burner and say, hey, we got it all down. We can figure this thing out. We, we give in to fear because we seize the opportunity. We, because we think it'll never come back around, but we don't wait for God's plan. We want to make, it own, make our own plan happen. We don't want to submit ourselves to God, but we want the benefits of his presence, right? Come on. We use God like a genie in a bottle. We use him, oh, like a sugar daddy. But when... when, when Y'all know what I'm talking about? You pull God out when you want him. You pull him off the shelf when you need him. You pull him out, out, of the, out of the closet, out of the drawer, wherever he's at when you want him. I'm telling you, God wants to be there all the time for you. We want security. We take measures to protect our own selves, and we really don't rely on God to help us. But submission's hard. But I want to tell you something. Don't submit because you have to. Submit because you want to. That's what submission is. You know, you can be made to do anything. If you're married, you can be made to do anything. Can I get an amen? Anybody else amen? But do it because you want it. She, she's going to have a rebuttal uh, uh, message next week on all these points right here. But we must be reachable and not prideful. I struggle with pride sometimes. Does anybody else in here struggle, struggle with that one? But we don't have it all figured out because if we had it all figured out, we'd all be perfect, right? right? We're still going on this journey together. We're still having our basic training together. We have to, what does submission to God look like? We have to submit our heart. And many of us say that's an organ, but that's the inner part of our being, our inner person. The heart is the moral conscious. It steers our values and it helps us to make the right choices. When you get saved, you get a heart transplant. Right, Gary? Gary's on the heart transplant list over here. And we're praying that God's going to heal him in the name of Jesus right now. Come on. But when you come to Jesus, you get a heart transplant. Look at Ezekiel 36, 26. It says this. I will give you a new heart. And I will put a new spirit within you. I will take that heart of stone out and replace it with a heart of out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven 37 says this. You must love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. So we have to submit every part of our being to him. And what does it mean to submit our soul? Well, the soul is the part of the eternal that defines who you are as an individual. God, it says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and all your being. To be willing to give up your life to him. Come on, this is rough. I remember him having the conversation with the, with the disciples. saying, hey, you have to carry this cross. And you're going to have to go through a lot of things in this world. Uh, uh, but... but if you come out on the other, you're going to come out on the other side a winner if you'll just keep doing the things I'm telling you to do. But you have to be willing to submit to him and to die for him. And that doesn't necessarily mean physically die. You have to die to the old flesh. You have to die to the old person that you used to be. It means we, all of our activities and all of our priorities in our life, they have to revolve around what God wants us to do. We have to submit our minds, and we're going to talk about the mind. It's the battlefield, and we're going to talk more about that in a little bit later, but we have to submit our sinful tendencies. We have to submit our motives. We have to submit our pain. Come on. Some of y'all have been carrying pain around for your whole life. God said, I want you to submit yourself to me. Submit the, that shame that you've been carrying around, too, because I ain't got time for that shame anymore, God's saying. Basic training, each day you got to get up and you have to yield and you have to submit. Maybe you just start out saying, God, I start out my day by submitting my heart, submitting my soul, and submitting my mind to you. Teach me how to walk this day because sometimes we just need him to tell us every step to take. So many times we just need to get up and we need to say, God, I don't know where I'm going today, but can you take me there? 
God, will you put somebody in my path today? Come on. I heard somebody say the other day, they got up every morning and said, put somebody in my path today that I can be, and I can affect and I can become. He can do that for you if you'll ask him each day. You got to say, I can't do any of this without you. I need you each and every minute. But listen, without submission, there can be no resistance. Resist the, re, resistance, the de, resist the devil, it says. Resist means to withstand, to strive against, or oppose. But how do we do that? Well, we have to start relying on God and not ourselves. So many times we're trying to rely on the things that we do and the things, uh, the money we make or the, or, or, or the plans that we have, and, and we put God somewhere on, on the backside of the burner, and I'm guilty of that one too. I'm guilty of a lot of this stuff I'm preaching to you all out there, so don't think I got it all perfectly together. We usually use resistance as a defensive maneuver, right? We try our best. How's that working out? We do the best that we can. Then we end up finding ourselves in the same place that we always were, and we don't know how to get out of it. Well, we have to start relying on God, and don't engage the enemy in your own strength. Because let me tell you something. You try to do it on your own, you're going to fail every single time. Can I get an amen on that one? It cannot be fully done in your own power and in your own strength, but that's not giving you an excuse. Next thing you've got to do to resist, you have to run to God. The Bible says God is our refuge. God is our strength. He is the one. He's our firm foundation when everything around us is crumbling down. We can resist the enemy by knowing and confessing the word of God and being able to recite that back. When he was tempting Jesus in the, in the desert, the enemy was, he came to him and he was quoting the Bible. And, and what Jesus did, he resisted him by quoting the Bible back. So many times, I've said this before, you gotta get you a verse. You gotta get you some verses in your arsenal. And when the enemy comes at you, you gotta be able to recite that back and say this. Listen, sometimes you just have to speak a thing to make it come to pass. You gotta tell yourself, I have the mind of Christ. When your mind's going 100 miles an hour, you can say that when you feel weak, you can say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Resistance is also being on guard and being alert. Can I just tell you, we're in a spiritual warfare. We're in, we're in a spiritual war right now. And when you're in one, you're going to get pushed back from the enemy on every side. He's going to try to attack your identity. He's going to try to attack, make you doubt yourself. And you may feel unqualified. Hello, Gideon. Hello, Rahab. Hello, John the Baptist. They felt unqualified. Then he whispers in your ear, you're just not good enough. Pastor Johnny opened up and said he had a struggle last week. We're, we're all battling something in the last couple of weeks. And he said the enemy was coming to him telling him that he's less than. And this was something from years and years ago. Satan does not relent. He will keep bringing stuff back that you did 25 or 30 years ago. He'll do it. Multiple people have had car problems this week. Michael, we were talking the other day, and his phone wasn't getting any of my texts. And as soon, uh, as soon as he went out, he did it. What'd you do? Just You restarted it? He reset his phone. He had over 50 text messages. Not one of those were from Christian people, too. You think the enemy doesn't have an agenda right now? He's trying to get us distracted. The women's crew had to end up canceling the last minute due to child care issues. And that same afternoon, Jason and Sherry were in a, in, a, in, a, in a car wreck and it hurt their back. So, you know, everything that we, you know, and I was talking to Jeanette this morning. She's saying, I'm going through that too right now. Everything that we know, because we have opened up. <sighs> we have opened up the box. And now we have got to be able to, to, to know and to fight the enemy, not on our terms, but on God's terms. So we're winning this battle. But it's not, listen to me, y'all, here's the part you're all going to get. It's not always the devil's fault. We sometimes just need to wage war against ourselves. Here's Paul, second greatest preacher ever, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, Romans 7, he says this, I love God's law with all my heart, but there is another power within me that is at war with my mind. This power makes me a slave to sin that is still within me. Oh, what a miserable, 
person I am. And the old in King James, he said, oh, wretched man that I am. Who will flee from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Here's Paul. It gives me a little confidence to know that Paul struggled too. He didn't have it all together. Sometimes we look at people, and, and, and again, I've said this before, we, 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 we live in a social media world right now. We're looking at everybody. Oh, everybody looks so great. But listen, people are struggling out there. They may be putting a smile on their face. They may be acting like everything is okay, but they're still struggling. They're still going on something on the inside of them. What happens, it opens up to the enemy, it causes us to sin, causes us to doubt, it causes fear to rise up us, and also disobedience. It takes a firm no to tell the devil no. Okay, Satan, you can leave me alone. Hey, why don't you just quit bothering me and just, just don't, don't, don't mess with me. Sometimes you just gotta say no! And then you gotta run! Like on the first bad date. Sometimes you just have to have a firm no to say no. But also being resistance comes along with being relentless. If you're talking about Jacob in the Bible, Jacob was a deceiver. He was not submitted at all to God's plan. He was resistant to everything God wanted him to do. He tried everything his own way, and he found out that it didn't work. So then he became relentless. He had an encounter with God, and he said, listen to me, God. He said, I'm not going to let you go until you bless me. Sometimes we have to be that relentless with God. I'm not going to let you go, God, until you answer the prayer that I have. Some of y'all have been praying a prayer for the last 20 years, and I'm telling you, right on the verge of God making that come to pass, and you don't give up. Be relentless. Next step to spiritual training is this. We've got to draw near to God. Let's look at verse 8. It says, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse or wash your hands, you sinner, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Draw near and hearing God. Are you sitting on opposite ends of the couch? Come on. Boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives. Have you ever had that moment where you're sitting on your end of the couch? And she's sitting on her end of the couch? And it's that look like, Oh, man, y'all must not ever fight. <laughs> it's that look you get, like, and it's that silence that you get. It's the ignoring each other. And you're sitting on the total end of the couch, trying not to make this thing weird, but it's getting weirder by the moment. <laughs> but until that person has received Jesus as their personal Savior, it's a likelihood they probably won't hear from God because they're not listening. Until a person receives Jesus, other than salvation, they are sitting on the opposite end of the couch, not hearing from God. Listen, he's not motivated to speak to any of us based on our good deeds or our needs. He's motivated to speak to us because we are in relationship with him. That's why he's motivated. He knows what you need. He, know, he knows you're doing some good things, but he wants to have that personal relationship with you. If you're having trouble uh, hearing God's voice or knowing or drawing close to him, maybe you need to reevaluate the relationship that you're in with him. The Bible says you draw near to him and he'll draw near to us. All he's looking for is a willing heart to come closer to him. The more that you come closer to him, I'm going to tell you, you're going to find out he will draw near to you and he will change your whole way of thinking about certain things. Listen, when you start hearing the voice of God, and some people say, I've never heard the audible voice, there's a voice that's inside of you. You may never hear God say, Richard, you better. You may never hear that. But there's that little moral compass that goes off in your mind. There's that little bit of something that tells you, hey, I better be paying attention to this. But as we approach God, we got to be submissive to him and his will for us. We have to be obedient, and we must trust that he has only the best. Here's where the enemy gets you. God has only the best for you. He only wants the right things for you. But the enemy is always on your shoulder trying to tell you, what's God done for you lately? That's what he did to Eve. He said, hey, you know, it's all the women's fault. He did. He <laughs> Kidding. That's what he did to Eve. He said, did God really say that? He started bringing up doubt, and, and then he said, well, if you do that, then, then you'll be like God. All of a sudden, the pride raised up in both of them. 
But listen, we got to come before him with a thankful heart for all that he's done for us. Listen, if you do nothing else in your prayer life, thank God for where he's brought you from. Yeah. 